Lisbon, Portugal is so popular. Well, why are people moving here? I'm with Becky to talk exactly why she's here and why maybe you would want to live here. All right, so let's just jump right in. Why are you in Lisbon? So I came here after being a digital nomad for about two and a half years. Um, during the pandemic, I decided it's going to be really great to get a base again. Uh, I used to actually live in Tokyo, Japan for 12 years as an expat. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and in 2017, I got on the road. And then, yeah, in the pandemic, I actually was in Japan again because I have permanent residency there. So I was able to be there as long as I wanted, but I'm like, I want to get a new base. I want to figure out where it's going to be. And actually in 2018, uh, during my travels, I met a Portuguese couple and I went to visit them in 2018, a few months later in Lisbon, and I visited them again in 2019. And so I thought, I know Lisbon, I feel comfortable here, and most importantly, they have this D7 visa program, which is what I ended up getting, and it allowed me to live here and didn't take too long to apply and actually get it, so here I am. Awesome, okay, and we'll talk about the D7 visa process in a little bit, but let's talk about the pandemic. Did you move here before that or during that or what was your moving process like? So I thought I could come here. I actually came in the middle of the pandemic. It was August of 2020, but I thought I could get here and apply for everything from here. I also thought because of the pandemic, there might be some um, ways I could do it without having to move and go back to my home country. But once I got here, I was told that given all the situation and the circumstances, it would be better to go back to my home country and start the application process from there. So while I was here, I got the NEF, the tax number, and I actually um, set that up and got a lot of information, saw a lot of neighborhoods. Then I went back to the US again in the pandemic and I applied for everything. It only took about a week when I got back to apply and send everything in. Awesome, okay, so this is actually really good information. You can't come to Portugal currently and apply for your D7. You're supposed to do it from your home country or where you are a resident of. So that's good to know that Becky tried, a lot of people try, and they said, no, you can't do that. You have to go back to your home country. So we went back to the US. It took you about a week, but what about that? Did you have to get an FBI background check? Yes. Yeah, so that was part of the, I applied for that online and they started doing that before I even got to the States. But the issue, the real issue, I think in Lisbon that was the bottleneck was the digital fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. They said the place to do it is at the U.S. Embassy, but it was about a two-month wait at that time to get an appointment at the U.S. Embassy. So I said, oh, there's like a place right near the airport in my hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio, where I can just go straight from the airport, actually, which is what I did. And did the fingerprinting. It was like $25. And then I used that to finish the FBI background check application. Once that came in, that the background check, I just, you're not supposed to open it. Yeah, so I didn't need the apostille. I actually asked you, you need the official stamp, but they're like, no, as long as you don't open that, you're fine. Mm -hmm. so. That is one of the number one things you have to remember when you get that background check is that you don't open it. And I know a lot of people are curious. So if you're curious, you can pay a little extra and get the results emailed to you as an unofficial copy. But you, the official copy that comes to you, you keep that envelope sealed so that you don't have to get it apple sealed because that's just another step, more time, more money. So you don't want to deal with that, right? <laughs> right, yeah. And for some people, depending on where they're from in the US, it's more driving to go find that apostille or more time waiting. To it really them. is, yeah, it's a big pain. Okay, so you got that stuff done in a week. So you were just flying on, I need this, 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 like you did it all yourself. Yes. Okay. I will say I was lucky at the time because when I applied, I didn't need a 12 month lease, which is now a thing. I, I don't know if all of the different consulates in the US are requiring that, but that helps speed it up a little bit. Yeah, it depends on your consulate lit here, uh, whether it's a six month, 12 month, some are a little stricter than others. So yeah, it depends what state were you applying from. You said Ohio, Ohio, Ohio which Cincinnati. is connected to DC. Yeah, which so. is a little bit of an easier route because you can mail stuff in. You don't have the requirement of the um, in-person interview in San Francisco. So it's a little bit of an easier route, but yes. So requirements do change. And of course it was 2020 when you did this. So some things are slightly different and we have a course, a DIY course, if you want to check that out. Uh, that'll be in the description below and you can obviously email us to get information about that to help you do it yourself because we did it ourselves, Becky did it herself, so if you don't want to have to pay a lawyer or someone then, then you don't have to, you have that option. But you can also pay someone if it makes you feel more comfortable, right? right. Some people are a little better at that. Okay, so let's just jump right into Lisbon. 
How do, how do you like it here? I really like it. I think one thing that was important for me because I had been a digital nomad for about three years before that, Lisbon to me felt like a great balance where I could feel like I was traveling a bit by being here because so many people are always coming into Lisbon to visit you, but also a lot of nomads make this place their base for part of the year because there's so many co-working spaces, there's so many events for nomads. So I still have that nomad spirit despite now having a base for about half of the year. Okay. Here in Lisbon. Great. So you, you've you come across uh, digital nomads. You've come across people who are also on the D7 here, people mm -hmm. who are retired. Have you, I mean, like, what kind of people do you come across? Is it always expats? Is it Portuguese? Like, who do you see, I guess, on a daily or weekly basis? It's a real mix. Right now, I would say I still go to the digital nomad meetup on Thursday nights here in Lisbon. It's a big one. There's usually more than 100 people every wow. time. Uh, that is one place where I do run into a lot of people that have just arrived that are also thinking about the visa and a lot of expats, but also I go to the gym and I see a mix of Portuguese and expats at my gym. Um, and depending on the hobby I'm looking into, it could be all Portuguese, um, but I'm still learning Portuguese. I, I usually am still using English with them. Uh, that's a goal for especially next year, let's say. Yeah. Okay. So I want to touch on two things. We'll talk about language in a second, but then also meetups. It sounds like uh, there are a lot of people doing meetups depending on what your hobby is like. What kinds of things uh, can you get into and how do you get connected to those types of communities? Yeah. So I've used uh, Meetup as the, the app Meetup and also Eventbrite. Sometimes they'll have separate things on there. And both of those, there's such a variety of things to do here in Lisbon. I like improv. So I've been to the weekly improv meetup in the park, uh, and that was interesting. There was a mix of Portuguese and expats there, but we were doing it in English, so it tended to be more expats. Mm -hmm. I recently went to an event on a Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. called Open Coffee Lisbon, and there were 40 of us at wow. 9 a.m. on a Tuesday, mm -hmm. and we all had different businesses, and we were sharing what we wanted to do with them and, and just meeting new people. And I loved that meetup because such a variety of people, there was a casting agent who worked, uh, she's a Portuguese casting agent. She's like, if you want to be in commercials or you want to try to be an extra in movies, contact me. And I'm like, wow, cool, just yeah. by going to a meetup, you can yeah. get in touch with these people. So it can be a little bit of building your community, but also networking depending on what you're doing. Yeah. And I also, I will confess, um, I enjoy cryptocurrency as well. This is a huge hub for that. There's a, every Friday at six here in Lisbon, there's a co-working space that does drinks and it's just Everybody comes and chats about that if they want. And yeah, that tends to be a lot of expats, but also curious Portuguese that are trying to figure out how to, at the moment, not pay any tax on their cryptocurrency. Yeah, here in at Portugal. the moment, yeah, we'll see. At the moment, yeah, yeah guys, it could change. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, now back to the language. So here mm -hmm. in Lisbon, um, what level of Portuguese do you need? Can you get by with all English? What's the language like? So you really can get by with all English, I, I will say that. Um, I often ask, do you speak English? Is one of the first things I say. A lot of people say no, but they do. And this happened a lot in Japan as well. But um, what you can do is just speak very clearly and, and keep it really simple if, it, if there really is a language barrier. But I use a lot of Google Translate at the moment. I, I feel a little frustrated that Brazilian Portuguese is the main go-to in like Google Translate, yeah. but it, it's, you know, European Portuguese is very different. Um, but I'm, I'm getting better and better and having to use the Google Translate all the time. Like I'm, I'm, start, I'm picking things up just from reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, I also use Duolingo. I've done 365 days in a row. Just did that yesterday. Congrats, on that's great. Yeah, <laughs> and it's taught me a lot of Brazilian Portuguese, but there is of course a, a point that you hit with Duolingo where you're not really uh, learning new things, especially after you finish the entire Portuguese um, course that they have. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's another, it was fun. It was fun to get like every day, um, you know, practice with it and, and keep remembering different phrases. So. Any other recommendations for learning? Are you doing mainly online stuff? Are there in-person classes that you know of? Like what's, what, how can people learn the language here? Okay. So there's a couple of ways. Like I used italkeye.com at one point, which I like because you can choose where your teacher is from, depending on the type of, especially for Spanish. It, it was, it could be very different depending yeah. on the country. Mm -hmm. And I used that. It was about I mean, you could find it as little as $8 an hour um, oh. for a lesson, especially if it's a trial 
Bell lesson. Mm -hmm. They're also, and I'd have to give you the email of this because it's not an actual name, but the local governments here have schools where you can do a course for basically for free. It's like 25 euros, but it requires you to be here about four, four months in a row. You do have classes in person. Mm -hmm. So if you're coming and you're staying for a while, this could be a great option. And they, it's like A1, A2, and they will eventually give you a certificate that you can use for your language tests yeah, or to the, show for the citizenship. Yeah, that's for citizenship. So if you're planning on doing that, then you can do that course rather than having to take a test, right, for the citizenship. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and put some of those links in the description below on the different areas where you can learn languages, whether it's in person or online. We'll have some of that stuff, so check that out. Okay, let's move on to cost of living. This is a big one for people. They, you know, a lot of people want to come here because they feel like it's a bit more affordable. Is Lisbon affordable? Tell us about housing prices, things like that. Yeah, so I, I have been hearing from a lot of friends that the rent has been going up here in Lisbon. I think people are now on average paying like 900 euros for a one bedroom or let's say 1200 to 1500 for a two bedroom. And it depends on your area, it depends on a lot of things. But I actually bought an apartment last year in September. So I will tell you that I spent 180,000 euros for it. I did get a mortgage and that I think was helped because I work very consistently as a freelancer. I make about the same every month and I've been doing the same uh, job for five years. So it looked very stable. Mm -hmm. Took about two to three months for that mortgage to get approved. Um, but now I'm paying 510 euros a month for the next 20 years for my apartment. Um, and then I pay the utilities and things on top of that. My utilities are like 20 to 30 euros for water every month and the electricity can, well, I've heard it's going to change a little bit and increase here in Europe, but mm -hmm. right now it's about 40 to 50 a month, which I don't think is bad. Um, especially I hear things in the U S it's like massive bills for big houses that you're in. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this is a one bedroom. It's a one bedroom. It's a 68 square meters 68, okay. and it's an Alcantara. Okay. Which is near the LX factory. Yeah. Uh, cool. Five minute walk from Great there. Area, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Okay, so that's obviously a very good option for people if you want to come and you want to buy. Foreigners can get mortgages here, so that's great. And then your monthly is 510, you said? Yeah. Rather than paying a, a rental price of maybe nine or upwards of a thousand, depending on where you are. So mm -hmm. that is an option that you can go uh, and, and get a mortgage, which is nice. And interest rates are quite low. Um, and yeah. we have a connection with the mortgage, mortgage broker as well if people want to get in touch with him. So great. Okay, so cost of living, what about like um, eating out, public transportation? Um, how much do you spend on those things? Yeah, so, um, well, to go to make one other point, I also have private health insurance and I chose the, the top of three plan of three tiers of plans mm -hmm. and even the top for myself is 87 euros a month. That's, that that's was amazing. nothing yeah. to me. And I live five minutes from a very nice private hospital, which I can use now with that. Perfect. Okay. So, so then, um, the private hospitals around Lisbon, what do you know? Some of the names of the different private hospitals for those? Yeah. So there's one called Luz, uh, L U Z Luz de Lisboa is one of the top ones and they have their own app where you can schedule all of your appointments in English and in, in English. Okay. Yes. Okay. And there's also a, a big chain of hospitals called CUF, mm -hmm. C U F. Mm -hmm. And the, that's one of them that I go to. So, okay. um, yeah. And they have an app and it's, they have a French bakery in the basement. Like oh, they have all kinds fancy. of, uh, <laughs> yeah, they don't have a grand piano. A lot of those hospitals, you'll find a grand piano. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Is it pronounced Koof or C-U-F? I you have, know? I've heard them saying Koof in the okay. hospital, okay. Uh, which I didn't know. Yes. Until I went in, maybe you're going to hear both. But yeah. It's, that's one it's of those funny. things like before we moved here, we called it S-E-F, but then we got here and like, oh, people call it Seth. Yes. You know, so I it's like, Koof I don't know. Is what yeah, going to to uh, make it it's easier. probably more, I think for us, we always think if you see like, you know, three capital letters and you say the letters, but here it seems like they actually pronounce like Seth or Koof or Nif, right? Yeah. <laughs> All of those that you have to learn when you get here. And I will tell you, like, just to be completely transparent, I have had to make like co-payments when I've gone to Koof and some private hospitals are cheaper than others with that. Mm -hmm. But I've been paying like, I think at most I paid 30 euros on top of it. And this is for big tests, like exams, scans. And I'm like, I can't imagine what I would be paying in the U.S. Yeah, definitely. Or with travel insurance, which is which is what I had for about three years as a nomad. Oh yeah, that's why you'd have to have so, that. Okay, and yeah. did you do your private health uh, insurance through your bank? 
or how did you get that? That's a good question. So a lot of a lot of when you get here is networking with other expats. So a friend of mine recommended a guy to me. He's like an insurance broker. Ooh, a guy. <laughs> he was very good. Fernando was great. And okay. He uh, just he signed me up completely through emails, and then he sent a document. I signed it. It was all online, and it took about. Okay, so this is important to know because I was unsure at the beginning. When you sign up for this private health insurance, you cannot use it for the first two months, mm -hmm. but they will make you pay for those two months anyway. So the first month I was being charged, I was being charged every two weeks. And I'm like, Fernando, something's wrong. He's like, you have to back pay. And that's good for your planning as well. It, because if, if you need something major or you want a major exam, like get, get that two months over with at the beginning. Yeah. I think so. it's like when you find out you have something and then you get on insurance, they try to make sure that like you don't do that, right? Like, Oh, I'm pregnant or something. And so now I need insurance. <laughs> you kind of have to, yeah, get those two months out of the way. Um, the trial thing or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's definitely good advice. Great. Um, okay. So you were saying before that you were on travel insurance because you were doing the nomad thing, but now you're here in Lisbon and less nomad. Are you traveling a little bit or, um, and what's your job? Tell us what you do. And and if people want to get in touch with you and yeah, so I've been a proofreader for about five years for, I have a few clients now, but one of them is sending me a lot of academic journals, which I just read the, the English, fix the grammar. And I, I like it because it's very flexible. It's, yeah. it allows me to like work from a plane, work from a boat, work from a bus. I've done it all. <laughs> um, but I can keep moving to the next place and not lose time with work. Uh, that's my main that's job. Yeah. I also have a podcast where I interview digital nomads and it's called the school of travels. Uh, I'm still doing two, about two episodes a month. Um, but in, through that podcast, um, I had a friend who actually hired me to do podcasts for their company. It's called digital nomad world. It's still pretty new. It's growing and growing every month, but I do half hour interviews every week there as well. So check that out too. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Again, we'll put that stuff in the description. So you can get in touch with Becky or check out those different websites, podcasts, things like that. So, yeah. okay. Awesome. So you, how did you get into proofreading? Like, cause some people want to retire, you know, but they don't want to actually stop doing something or they want a little bit of, of income. So this proofreading, tell us how you got into that. If anyone's interested in doing something like that. <laughs> I'm glad you asked because my story, I don't know if it's replicable, but it's really funny. Okay. So I was in Japan in a guest house with about 20 other people. And one of the guys really wanted to start working remotely. This was back in like 2014, 15. And I said, you know what? You're teaching English. You, you're better than that. You're working for the lowest company. Aim higher. And he's like, <laughs> Becky, within a year, I'm going to be working online. And we like pinky sweared on a train. It was like, okay. this thing. next month he had a website already made where one year till I'm online. And then he realized his father, an organic chemist, was working for the same company and uh, doing content editing. And through his dad, good old nepotism, yeah. he got this job proofreading. And then he's like, Becky, you inspired me. You've changed my life by be allowing me to work online like this. I want to help you try, try to work for this company. That's how it works. Awesome. It was very okay. surprising. I never said I'll be a proofreader, you know, but it, it's worked out. It's been really, I guess that my work is good enough and consistent enough that yeah, they keep you they've on. kept yeah. me on and he still works for them as well. So, and it's just in English. You don't have to know Japanese. It's just in English. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah it's, it's all in English. Japanese is a tough language. <laughs> and these papers are from all over the world, including Azores, Coimbra, Lisbon. I've seen it all. Okay. So, Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, the power of networking, right? I mean, this is really important why you have to get out, build a community, start talking to different people about what they do, what you do so that you can network and, and get connections like this, right? It's so important. Like I think that open coffee Lisboa would be what, one of of those things or I, I got one job by going to a pub quiz uh, and <laughs> joining two random guys one of the guys turned out to be a hiring manager for his company so nice it's yeah I think so, tell like tell people about yourself even if they I mean Americans we're, we're good we're famous for this but like, <laughs> yeah. tell your whole life story in the yeah, first yeah. five minutes yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it helps with some people they are listening and they might think you're perfect for something that you've never even thought of before yeah because they might so. be looking right and then yeah Great connection. And be ready awesome. to be flexible. As you move to, to Lisbon, like you're going to, you know, change. A lot of things are going to change and it can be open to new things. I'm glad you said that. Cause I was just thinking in my mind, the next question I want to ask is like, what was so sh like anything shocking or surprising when you got here that you want to warn people of, or just make people aware of like moving to Lisbon. Okay. So <laughs> if you remember guys at the beginning of the interview, I lived in Tokyo for 12 years 
You may have heard about the Japanese work ethic, which is more similar to the American work ethic. Like both countries are workaholics, but、uh -huh. Japan even more so. Which is one reason I ended up leaving. I, I decided、okay. I want more balance in my life. But、um, here, that work ethic is different. It's like it's a slower pace of life here. I want to aspire to that. I'm not there yet. I was way too ingrained into a different type of work ethic.、Mm. So I've had to learn a lot of patience and. I think Japan is an outlier in terms of being on time and <laughs>、yeah. being very high quality with like customer service. It's it's really the highest quality customer service I've ever seen.、Mm -hmm. So I'm on another like not an extreme end, but I'm having to adjust from where I came from. And so like I've often had to call people back a few times to come and service something in my house, or and I at first was trusting that everything would get done on time the first time. Yeah, but yeah. You, you need、so、to.、Much. That was a bit shocking for me, coming from where I came from. So maybe so. a little bit persistence isn't necessarily nagging here. It's just more cultural that it's okay to call back and get because you're looking for something. Call back, call back, or go. You got to kind of get out there, right? Yeah. Not just let them come to you in a sense. To be honest, this is one thing I wanted to do self work on when I left Japan. I said I live on autopilot in Japan. I could live my whole life half awake, and I and things would happen. I need to push myself. I imagine being in New York trying to hail a cab and like getting in front of someone else. And I said I need to go somewhere where I will be pushed. And I I have been pushed here more, but I think it's a good thing. Okay. For myself. Awesome. And negotiate like this leads to like negotiation as well. I'm still working on it, but because I have that Japanese side now, where I'm like, okay, okay,、uh -huh. you know, don't rock the boat. But yeah, here it's good to stand up for yourself and you know make sure things get done. Yeah. Okay. Be、good、persistent. To good to know.、Said. Uh, any places in Lisbon that you would tell people that are moving here, like、uh, that's not the best place to live or not the best place to go? I wouldn't recommend that. That one's maybe more up and coming, so it's ten years away from being a place. Any locations that you say, ah,、uh, don't bother going there? Okay, so、uh, there's a few. Well, there's a lot of places I would go as a tourist. For example, Bairu Alto. Uh, this area is the place to be around Caixa Sodre as well, like when you first get here. But it's noisy、mm -hmm. at night. Santush, which is just slightly to the west of that, is up and coming and trying to become that area. But I've driven through Santush late at night as well, and it's been crazy on the weekends, especially. Okay. So if you want a quieter place, I wouldn't try to live in Bairu Alto. I would live maybe slightly above it in Saldanha or. Um, Avenida Shnovash,、mm -hmm. but those places are more expensive, so they've already probably been priced accordingly. So it depends on your budget, but if you, yeah, I think the tourists, the 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 amount that we have in, especially Bairu Alto, is going to get old for you as you become someone who lives here more full time. Yeah, definitely. The same time, I, there's this neighborhood called Marvila. Which is a little bit disconnected from public transportation, but it's it's well priced right now. It is up and coming. I think at night there's not too much to do after like 11 or 12. But I like that area. I like going over there. It's close to Parque de Nasoish,、okay. which is like used to be one of the.、Um, they it's a much different looking area. Very nice. It's also called Expo. Expo, People yeah. Call it Expo.、Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, those two areas are, are good, but Marbella is still a bit rough. So if you're go take a look at that before you think about living there. Okay, great. So noise wise.、Um You ma you mentioned a few. Are there any others that you can think of? Like this is going to be really good for tourism for going out, but maybe not living anywhere else. You can think of just to give our viewers. Oh, and、um, the other thing I wanted to ask was、um, airplane noise. That's another、yeah. noise thing that happens a lot in Lisbon. Any places that you're like, oh, it's really loud there, or yeah. So anywhere. I mean, I'm sitting at the airport. If you see any anywhere near the airport.、Um, The Campo de Arique, I really like that area. It's it's like still also not fully connected to the metro yet. It will be more so when Estrella Station opens.、Mm. But I think they do have a lot of plane noise. They have a wonderful food market and a lot of French influence. But yeah, you hear the planes a lot. Also in Alcantara, where I live, you will hear the planes sometimes.、Um, you will hear them frequently, but not so not so loud as if you were by the airport because、yeah. they're a little higher still when they're coming in. Because that's something that I didn't really notice until someone mentioned to me, and I was like, oh wow. Because in Porto, we don't really hear the planes that often. But I found that in more neighborhoods around Lisbon, you can actually hear, or they get quite close. So you can. See them、um, going over you. So I was like, oh yeah, that's something to kind of note. Like, so if you're looking for a place to rent or live, maybe be in the apartment for a little bit, open the windows, kind of get an idea <laughs> if it's too noisy. Whether that's cars, people, planes, any of that stuff, because noise could be obviously a, a bad thing if you don't want to be up 
at late, late at night, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, and we, there's, I was gonna say one more thing about the neighborhood. So Intendent or Anjos, I don't think there's as much plane noise there, but it is up and coming. It's connected to the Metro. It's a little bit farther north from the uh, Rocio area or the Baidu Altu. So that could be a good in-between. And I've heard more and more people saying they're staying around there. Okay. Um, so. And Josh and I did a breakdown of five really good neighborhoods, so we'll put that playlist in the description below. If you're looking for the different neighborhoods, you can see what they look like, you can get a feel if you want to live there. Um, okay, so any advice you would give people who are interested in moving to Lisbon, maybe on the D7, um, what, what would you tell them if someone came to you? Yeah, if it's possible, definitely make that exploratory trip in person first because you can also open your, ta you can get your tax number while you're here and even open a bank account pretty easily first. Um, and you know, you don't have to use the bank account. I used Activo, mm -hmm. which is connected to Millennium. There's no fees with that. So if I have no activity, it's, I haven't really lost anything. Um, and I think exploring those neighborhoods, like you said, with the links you have in a video, um, cause you just get a feel and there's no way to really hear everything and see and think about what you really want for, for the place you want to live unless you can come here first. And as I said before, I had come here twice before I thought about the D7. Yeah. Um, and I'd been shown quite a few areas by then. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, let's chat a little bit about the bank account because Millennium recently came out saying that they weren't going to, well, a lot of the branches aren't going to open bank accounts for foreigners now. You have to have a, a residency here. Have you seen that? No, that's yeah. that's news to me. And again, this happens. You like get all set up, and you're like, okay, I'm coasting along. Yeah. And you're like, but and that is the thing too. Check the latest information. Yeah, things are ever changing. Even with the NIF too. Sometimes you get caught in this loop because I get this question a lot. Oh, can I come on a scouting trip and get my NIF and get my bank account? And it, I tell people it tends to be more of a headache trying to get this because you end up going to the finances. And sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you can't. It's just a bit of a pain. And it's like, do you want to spend your scouting slash vacation dealing with the bureaucracy? here or you know if you're okay paying with it maybe just have someone do it for you and there are companies that do this for a reasonable price rather than paying really high prices for lawyers so just check check those things out right yeah yeah I think just always think about your time like is it can I just pay this amount of money to help them open my knee like what am I making an hour or you know how much are you gonna value your time right it's always between time and money right you have yeah. to kind of see which one is the more important thing yeah, right. I could see that happening with Millennium because I, I know there's a lot of people coming in and the line to get in is, is getting longer, uh, which I mean, I understand it's a beautiful place to live and it's, it's pretty vibrant here. So yeah, I, well, I hope they can find out the yeah. best way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course you can always email us so we can give you the latest information on what's going on. Cause we're kind of, you know, keeping in the loop with all of that stuff for sure. Yeah. So if people want to get in touch with you, you know, you, you said the different companies that you work for, you have your podcast. Uh, is there any way that people can get in touch with you? Sure. So I always say the easiest way to get in touch with me, you can either check out the school of travels.com, which is my, it has contact details there. It's my uh, website for my podcast, or you can go on Instagram to at Tokyo Becky. I'm still Tokyo oh, Becky. Still Tokyo. <laughs> I still go there once a year to keep up my residency. That oh. I, have so, I have a permanent residency there. Awesome. Um, but yeah, Tokyo Becky on Instagram. Okay, and guys, if you want to see more about Lisbon, then you can check out this playlist right in here and contact us if you need anything. I'm Kaylee with Expats Everywhere. Now let's get moving.